everyone. Welcome to the third and final presentation of the Nanaimo Historical Society's fall lecture series. Um, it's called After the Great War, Nanaimo Veterans Back Home. Tonight there will be two of us presenting and first I'd like to introduce my co-presenter Linda Broymans. Hi Linda, would you want to say something about yourself? Hi, um, well, I'm happy to be presenting with the Nanaimo Historical Society. Thanks for having me. Uh, I have a background in anthropology, where I've done a bit of historical research based in Europe, um, some of it on the First World War and the uh, border in Belgium and the Netherlands. So when I was doing some work at the archives and someone came in with this ledger, I was really excited to get a look at it and I've been busy transcribing it very slowly, <laughs> um, just trying to get an understanding of what was going on in Nanaimo in post-World War I with the returned veterans or the returned men as they call themselves. Thank you, Linda. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, you did mention that that uh, ledger came of the Great War Veterans Association came to us it's one, uh, it's number three, so we don't know where number one or number two are. It would be great to have them all. But as you mentioned, transcription, transcription is extraordinarily difficult. You're reading handwriting and sometimes it just doesn't make sense. So kudos to you for even doing it. Yeah. Um, I'm Christine Mutzner. I'm the manager of the Nanaimo Archives and I'm the programmer for the Nanaimo Historical Society along with Daryl Ose. So that's me. And I was gonna talk a little bit about um, what made me want to do this topic. Traditionally, the Historical Society has always done something military uh, around this time of year to commemorate uh, uh, Canadian military forces or other military forces, of course, too. And uh, so I've always been more interested in generally speaking, what happens to people when they come home from wars, what it's like on their daily lives. So between the Great War Veterans Association and the sort of functions that they did as a social club and everything that Linda's gonna talk about um, and advocacy and other things. I was interested in where they lived and how they lived and um, how they managed. Because after the war, as I'll talk a little bit about in my presentation, times were really tough. So this is a little bit of a look at the, some of the challenges, issues and hardships that veterans faced and uh, their families faced along with them, of course. And I would beg the audience now to understand that we're not professionals at this, so we might be a little bit fumbly, but uh, we'll give it our best shot and we hope that you enjoy it. Linda will go first, I will then come on, and then we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much for watching. watching. <laughs> we'll talk to you later. So like I said in the introduction, this presentation is on the Nanaimo branch of the Great War Veterans Association, looking at the reintegration of returned men following World War I. In 2018, the Nanaimo Community Archives received a donation from a person who found something that had been dumped at a local recycling facility where they worked. They found this and they thought, hmm, this looks kind of old. I wonder if there's anything important and worth saving in there. And what he found was the ledger of the Great War Veterans Association. Inside it were meeting minutes dating from 1923 to 1925. And here on the slide is a example of one of the pages from the ledger. Um, I've been working on transcribing the ledger because even though it only contains meeting minutes, I think it's a really fascinating window into the strange and difficult period in Canadian history uh, directly following the First World War. It deals with the aftermath of that war on the men who served and the way that they navigated their reestablishment in Canadian society when they returned. This ledger tells a little bit about the story of this group of men who had banded together through their common experience of serving in the First World War. It provides some details about the activities of the group and the causes that they debated over and supported. And it tells us quite a bit about how this society operated and who was involved in that operation. 
but it doesn't really tell us anything about these men's experiences of the war or about how they felt in their process of reintegration in Canadian society and in Nanaimo town life. It does give us a first-hand glimpse, however patchy and imperfect, uh, into a period that it seems to me maybe is fading from our collective awareness in Canada. I've tried to supplement the information that the ledger provides with other kinds of materials like Nanaimo Free Press articles, um, the service records from some of the men whose names appear in the ledger, census records to verify where they were and when, uh, immigration records to find out when a lot of these men immigrated to Canada prior to their volunteering to fight for in the Canadian Expeditionary Forces, um, birth certificates and any information, well they give more information into some of the service that the men provided. So what was the Great War Veterans Association? Essentially it was an organization of men who had served in the First World War. As an organization it spanned the whole of Canada and had 700 branches across the provinces. There were other organizations formed by World War I veterans, such as the more radical United Veterans League and the Grand Army of Canada, or the more conservative Army and Navy veterans, but the Great War Veterans Association was by far the largest and often considered the most representative of the needs and wants of World War I veterans. These veterans groups emerged from a shared sense that the government was not doing enough for returned men to help them reestablish in Canadian society. The government's primary focus was on providing assistance for sick and wounded soldiers, which is evident by the fact that the government ministry for returned soldiers was initially called the Military Hospital Commission in 1917. <clears throat> Disabled soldiers who could not take up their former employment were not allowed to decide for themselves on what kind of retraining that they would pursue. The government determined that retraining should be in a form of employment that was similar to what they had done before the war. They received eight months of this training and then it was up to them to go in, out and find work. But returned men who were not sick or injured were given $35 clothing allowance at discharge and a war service gratuity of up to $600 based on service. But the average for most men that they received from the war service gratuity was $240. In today's dollars, that would be about $3,200. The Canadian government had no intention of supporting able-bodied returned men, claiming that it was up to them to exercise the virtues of initiative and resourcefulness and to show a strong work ethic so as to succeed in civilian life. The austerity of the government with respect to its veterans wasn't the only cause for the formation of veterans associations such as the GWVA. Many returned men struggled to readjust to civilian life. It wasn't entirely uncommon for men to return to places of employment, uh, to jobs that employers had held for them, and to return to them only for a few weeks or even a few days before they abandoned those jobs. From the perspective of most civilians, many of the returned men were not fulfilling the social expectations of the soldier hero. Um, and on the other side, return men found that the hometowns that they had pined for while they were in the trenches were not meeting the expect their expectations either. Civilians were indifferent, if not altogether disdainful of their experiences, and they were often more focused on their own privations and sacrifices, which in the eyes of the veterans were relatively minor. This is a slide of the rather stately building which served as the Great War Veterans Association branch. And there's a whole story behind how this um, building became the building that the branch used. Uh, there was a lot of community support um, in terms of giving them 
the opportunity to purchase the building. Uh, okay, so what did the Nanaimo branch of the Great War Veterans Association do? On the national level, the Great War Veterans Association was a means to lobby government for things such as fairer, a fairer and more transparent process in the determination of pensions for disabled returned soldiers. There's a lot of literature on this that's really fascinating. Um, I can provide some references for that at the end of this presentation. Um, but it also provided a form of social support, as well as some financial and economic support to their members that were struggling, and to the widows of fallen soldiers that had lived in their communities. In Nanaimo, there was a relief fund that members had access to if they applied for it. The executive would investigate the claim of hardship and determine if a loan or grant in need would be made. Most of the loans, most often the loans were given. Um, they also gave $75 to widows of fallen men each Christmas, which in today's dollars that translates to about $1,100. Um, and because the economic situation in the area was increasingly difficult, and more and more men were reported to be out of work and looking for work, they lobbied that local jobs should be given to return men. There are many occasions where this is discuss actively discussed amongst the membership and, and recorded in the ledger. But they weren't always successful in those efforts. Um, other things that they did was they would cover funeral costs for return men who had passed if their families were not able to give them an appropriate burial. Um, and then a whole bunch of other things that I found in ref referred to in the ledger. They would hold, um, I guess, fundraising social events like whist drives and cribbage tournaments. They would also regularly host smokers, which I didn't even know what a smoker was before I read the, this term in the ledger. <laughs> Apparently it was a, an opportunity to smoke cigars together or smoke tobacco together um, is kind of a thing for men to do. Um, they also hosted picnics. They hosted one very large and rather expensive picnic. They would spend about $400 to host this picnic, sometimes on Newcastle Island, sometimes elsewhere throughout the Nanaimo area. Um, they would participate in the May 24th celebrations, um, sponsoring the May Queen's crown. <laughs> and they would also, they also decided, I think in 1924, 1925, that the Great War Veterans Association should have their own football club. So they owned and operated a football club. Um, and they sold poppies as a token of remembrance to fallen soldiers on what at the time was called Poppy Day, but today we call it Remembrance Day. The Great War Veterans Association was the first organization to start uh, with the sale of poppies. And the proceeds from poppy sales were meant to go directly towards the operations of the Great War Veterans Association. So ostensibly people would make these donations with the idea that they were supporting veterans in need. Uh, I found in the records that Poppy Day would usually raise about $250 for the branch, which is quite substantial. So who are the men of the Nanaimo Great War Veterans Association branch? Who are the men of Nanaimo's Great War Veterans Association branch? The branch itself had quite a large membership. Um, I've counted over 120 names of people who applied for membership throughout the 1923 to 1925 period. That is, I mean, almost every week there was a new name of someone applying to be a member which actually gives us an interesting picture into the dynamics at the time for returned men. 
uh, one question I had when I was reading this is where were all these men coming from and why were they, what were they doing in Nanaimo and where, what were they up to? Because I couldn't find them in the directory often for the most part. I also couldn't find them in the census. Um, I didn't know who these men were. And I think the best conclusion I can come to, and, and I'm not saying that this is definitely the answer, but my conclusion is that these men were transient men who were looking for work and, and used the Great War Veterans Association as a means to try and find work within that community. And if they couldn't find work in that community, they would move on to the next and join that membership and try and find work there. Um, and so that's my best explanation that I can give for why a lot of these names are not present in the directory uh, or in the census or anywhere else um, that I can find. Um, but the executive, which are the men who were making the decisions on the operation of the branch, were a different group of men from those men. Um, they were not a radical group of men, as far as I can tell. Um, they consisted of men who had lived in Nanaimo prior to the war, most of them, not all of them. They were men who were married prior to the war and had what I would call established careers, by which I mean they had stable employment before the war. And they left their wives and they left those uh, employment situations to serve. And most of the time, most of these men who are in the executive were over 30 years of, at the time of attestation. So some of them were almost 40 when they decided to serve in World War I. These are the names of the executive members, some of them, not all. Um, and I've done a little bit of digging to find out what I could on these men, uh, where they served, where they came from, were they stay, did they stay in Nanaimo for how long and that sort of thing. I also looked at what companies they served in, which is really a fascinating thing. The Canadian, a bunch of them served in the tunneling companies, which isn't surprising, I suppose, because for one thing, the number four tunneling company was formed in Nanaimo. Um, so a lot of the men that created that, that company were recruited through Nanaimo and in Nanaimo. Um, and a lot of these men were minors, so it's not surprising that they had a specific set of skills that unfortunately for the dynamics in the First World War uh, was actually a really important skill and a helpful skill. Um, so they served in the tunneling companies as sappers, which were, I mean, I suppose it was slightly easier to dig through this clay soil, which is where the trenches were, than in, you know, what they would do in their former employment as coal miners, um, but it was pretty brutal work based on what I could find um, in letters and such, and descriptions of the work that the Canadian tunneling companies did. So those are some of the men who, who were in the executive and served in the tunneling companies. Okay, so there were also a number of men from the executive who served in the forestry corps, like Robert Pallister and Charles Marsh. The Canadian Forestry Corps was a group of men that had specific skills in logging and working in mills. And there were a number that came from Nanaimo to work there. Though one thing that is interesting about the Forestry Corps is they were not on the front lines. So it was probably a good um, area to volunteer for if you are a married man with children to support. Um, maybe not so willing to serve on the front lines, but to provide a service that is viewed as essential to the war effort. Another group of men from the executive also served in the Army Medical Corps at, in the field ambulance, which is also not as dangerous, potentially, as serving in the trenches, um, but these men also received injuries. Uh, there are a few instances that I could find that these men were injured, 
probably retrieving fallen soldiers during in dangerous conditions. What kind of conclusions can I come to just looking at the material that the Great War Veterans Association ledger, these meeting minutes from a, this tiny sliver of time from 1923 to 1925, what does it actually tell me and what kind of conclusions can be drawn from it? And there's all kinds of sort of glimpses that you get into issues and into the life of these men, but it, it's, it's sort of filtered through the language of meeting minutes, which is a, a challenge. Um, and often the secretary would say that they would discuss an issue, but not, you know, detail any of the points of that discussion. So I'm given, as a reader, you're given a, a window into that this issue is important, but without any details on who thought what specifically. Um, so that get, that sort of makes it a bit of a challenge to look at meeting minutes. Um, okay. So there are five, four, three, two, one. So there are definitely limitations in terms of the kinds of conclusions that you can draw just based on the ledger and then the supplementary material that I've found. I think it would be helpful to find more documents that are based on the operations of the Great War Veterans Association, but the fact that this was recovered just by, by random from someone who worked at a recycling facility in Nanaimo sort of tells you the difficulties in, in finding those kinds of documents um, and whether or not they still exist. It's, it's likely that they don't anymore. Unless someone has them, please donate them to the Nanaimo Community Archives. Um, yeah, so what kind of conclusions could I come to? Uh, well, they're, they're vague and they're not grand, not as grand as I was hoping for. But one thing is that the organization of the Nanaimo branch was run by a particular group of men. Um, these men were not the average World War I Canadian soldier. The average World War I Canadian soldier was 26 years of age, and 80% of those soldiers were bachelors. And with the executive, most of those men were in their 30s, some of them even in their 40s, and almost all of them were already married. So these men, in terms of their volunteering for the war, I mean, it's just a completely different set of circumstances for them. Um, another thing I found is that almost all of them were immigrants to Canada from the United Kingdom. Uh, a few were from Ireland. And I mean, some of them had immigrated only a few years before the war, but others had immigrated 1900, 1906, 1909. Um, so they probably still had strong ties, um, and that might be a part of why they decided to serve. Um, yeah, but why is it that this group of men were the ones who formed the executive? And... That's an interesting question that I really found myself mulling over, um, that there aren't younger men and there aren't men who have a stronger political agenda. And it might be that this particular branch of the Great War Veterans Association was quite conservative um, and that maybe the other groups, if there was a Grand Army of Canada group in Nanaimo, maybe that's where all the radical people went. Um, it's, we just don't know. Um, it's, it's possible that the reason why the executive is a different group of men from the average Canadian veteran of World War I is just the nature of how local organizations operate. That it's people who are established in the community who, who run these kinds of organizations. And those people are generally older and have careers and have a position in the community. And so 
yeah, they're, these are the men who's, who form the executive in Nanaimo at the time. So I'll just finish off my presentation by thanking you for giving me the opportunity to present these preliminary findings. It feels like I have a mountain more work to do in terms of fleshing out all of the interesting little nuggets of information that the, that the ledger is, presents. Um, and I encourage anyone else to go to the archives and see what's available and what we can find out about Nanaimo and, and the people who've lived here and the kinds of lives that they had to carve out for themselves in this community, um, especially in this post-World War I period. Hello everyone and welcome to the second part of tonight's presentation. I will be talking about the Better Housing Scheme. So just give me a moment here and I will bring up my um, PowerPoint so that you can see it too. Hang on a sec. So there we go. So as I said tonight, I'll be speaking about the Better Housing Scheme and specifically about the Nanaimo experience. So in order to understand the Better Housing Scheme, we need to understand the conditions that prevailed after the war. There was a tremendous economic depression. There was labor unrest. Many of you will know about the uh, large strikes in 1919, the uh, Winnipeg General Strike. Uh, it was a worldwide phenomena and it caused a lot of social instability. Uh, not having any money, not knowing if you could uh, afford a decent home or even a place to rent, combined with all sorts of labor unrest led to social instability. And also the war had changed uh, some of the norms around family life and those sorts of things. So that's the context for the uh, better housing schemes coming into uh, existence. So here's just some stats for us to enjoy. Uh, between 1916 and 1918, building costs rose an average of 48%. Uh, that was largely due to a loss of labor during the war and also a shortage of material, uh, actual materials for building. This crisis was across Canada. Rents rose 50% across Canada. The Vancouver unemployment rate was 22%. And in Nanaimo, in the South in particular, 49% of the population were renters. Um, that is comparable to other places across Canada. In fact, a lot of places in Canada were in the uh, low 50s, so we were right in there. Um, and that's, that statistic is based on my reviewing 2,300 uh, residents of Nanaimo in 1921. So pretty bad, pretty, um, pretty tense right after the war. And voila, here comes the Better Housing Scheme. So the federal government in, in 1919 enacted the Better Housing Act, whereby they would give 25 million in low interest rate loans to help return soldiers buy their own homes. Um, this was, this was to, to go a long ways to sort of reintegrating soldiers into regular Canadian life and to um, take the temperature down of the uh, sort of strike mode the, uh, the sort of general air of, uh, of bad times. So the provincial government in BC uh, uh, was the one province that asked the most of this uh, fund from the federal government. We got in total 1.7, 1.5 million went to the lower mainland. So that leaves 200,000 for the rest of the province. In Nanaimo, they received in total $54,000 and they divided that among 18 applicants. We got that in two batches. One, the first one was for 30,000 and the second one was for 24. The average loan was about $2,800. We don't have full and complete records for every single application or for the entire process uh, of the term of the Better Housing Scheme, but that seems to be about the average, 2,800. And in Nanaimo in particular, they actually wrote it into their agreement with um, the province and among their applicants that they would prioritize or per their preference would be given first of all to widows and disabled veterans and wherever possible they wanted veterans to be the tradespeople 
who were working on those homes. The applications were vetted by the Better Housing Committee, which was a committee that operated in 1921, 22, and 23 to disperse these funds properly. And it was made up of council members and uh, members of the Great War Veterans Association that Linda has talked about. The plans and specifications for homes were approved by the committee and had to be approved by the building inspector. We have not been able to locate actual plans, but we do have an awful lot of specifications and they're incredible in their detail right down to what sort of metal finish would be right would be approved for the inside of a bedroom closet. Uh, interior colors had to be approved and uh, exterior colors and numerous other details within the home. So if you were an applicant, if you found out that this money was available, there was a few things that made it available to you. First of all, you had to have an annual income under 3000. The scheme was pitched towards working class in a kind of uplift mode to put them into a better kind of housing. Uh, the maximum loan that you could get would be 3000 at 5.5 interest. Now, interestingly enough, um, the 5% interest was just uh, what they had to pay back to the provincial government at the end of the day. But the 0.5 was something that Nanaimo added to cover the cost of their administration of these loans, because in effect, the city carried the mortgages. If you lived in your house after it was built for 10 years, you would get a rebate of $300. You, it's hard to tell because the records aren't complete, but it looks like basically a contractor drew up some specs, apparently, uh, supposedly with your cooperation to some extent, and you would end up having some stay, say in the style and finish of your home. But overall, it doesn't appear that the actual applicants had that much say in that kind of minute detail. So there you go. Now, this is what ended up happening is basically all of the plans drawn up were some version of what we would call a craftsman or a California bungalow style. And here's something I didn't know, but I find kind of interesting is that the word bungalow is a Hindi word. And it um, really essentially the definition is detached cottages built for early European settlers in India. The bungalow, that initial bungalow, uh, usually meant to quite smallish or medium sized houses. You can see the kind of craftsman California style bungalow that we have uh, in BC. You can see it, of course, across North America. It was particularly mm -hmm. popular in the 1920s, and you can see it as far afield as Australia has many homes that look like Nanaimo homes. Anywhere where there was a British influence, you tend to see a lot of these cottages or bungalows. So basically, here's the real basic elements, and of course, there's infinite variation on a home. Balanced and well-proportioned, but not symmetrical appearance from the front. So basically the porches would be offset. You didn't necessarily have a central door and two equal size windows, one on either side of the door. You could have the door offset and one of the windows could be smaller. You often had the rafters exposed. In Nanaimo they used an awful lot of gable brackets, which we'll see later. Modest front porch or veranda, not a giant sweeping one. And you often saw square tapered columns and sometimes they rested on things like river rock or brick. In Nanaimo, brick was not a particularly uh, big building material. It wasn't used a lot here, but we do have some examples, a few where river rock is used, but that tends to be on the more extravagant version of the California bungalow style. So inside there are usually one and a half stories. The front door opened onto the main living room, which was a switch from the more formal Edwardian or Victorian type home that opened onto either a front hall or a foyer. Um, there was no formal parlor or sitting room and simple decorative accents and plenty of built-ins and an awful lot of wainscoting and chair rails, often in quite dark wood. These were typical features of that style. Now, this is obviously a very uh, fancy version of a Craftsman bungalow, uh, certainly more substantial than we had here. This one was someplace in California. I can't quite recall the town, but just to say this, we have a few homes similar to this in Nanaimo, but the ones built 
under the Better Housing Scheme were essentially more a version of the one I've just put up. So kind of on the simpler side, but you can see what I mean about the offset front porch, the gable brackets, which are those little things under the roof and uh, uh, one or two big windows. Um, this is actually could be in an IMO, this photo. It's not, but it could be. There are a fair few houses like that here. And the first one we're going to look up, and I'm sorry about the quality of the picture. It gives you a little bit of a view, but it was really hard to um, get a good photo of this particular home. It's at 975 Comox, and it is the Millen's residence. So the person who applied for the Better, Hose, Better um, Housing Scheme grant, or it's not a grant, it's a loan, was Cyril Ewart John Millens. Born in England, he went to Victoria in 1905. At some point, he seems to have bounced back and forth between Victoria and later on Port Alberni and Nanaimo. But he was definitely here in Nanaimo as a house carpenter, and he lived with one other guy. And then he signed up in 1915 in Victoria, and he listed his occupation as sculptor, which stands out. We don't see that a lot. He served with the 48th, and then he was transferred to the, um, or he transferred himself, I don't know, to the 3rd Canadian Machine Gun Corps. And to the right there, you can see their insignia. And when he was discharged, he was discharged with the rank of sergeant. In 1915, in May, which he married uh, Beatrice Emily Penn, but he had already left for um, overseas, so he married this woman overseas. Uh, he certainly wasn't there for very long when he got married, March, April, May. It's possible he already knew her. He was discharged in 1919, and from there he went, came home, he came to Nanaimo, and he operated the Nanaimo Monumental Works on Comox Road, he was one of the few people, because his name was a little unusual, that we could actually confirm was active in the Great War Veterans Association. The people, just as a point of interest, the people who currently live at 975 Comox often find chunks of granite and other headstone materials in their yard. In 1929, he moved to Victoria, but he kept, he continued to own the monumental works. By 1939, he's the proprietor of the J. Mortimer and Sons Monumental Works. That um, Monumental Works has been in existence for over 137 years in, the, in Victoria, and it's, it's still operating. Uh, someone else, I think his name was Edward Crow, took over the Nanaimo Monument Works around the same time. Ultimately, Cyril, or C.E.J., died in Victoria in 1950. He is really worth watching, so to speak, because his legacy is not just in the house, not the fact that we can connect him to that house, but he was also the sculptor or stonemason who designed our war memorial, which is a very important piece of um, Nanaimo's public art, an important site of commemoration and reflection. And the other thing he designed on the left is the rock. <laughs> the plinth or whatever, it's not the plinth, but the stone that holds the plaque from the Historic Sites and Monuments Board. That whole thing used to be over near where the Cenotaph is now. And it's, uh, he signed it, he signed both of these things. It's a much more abstract version, so uh, we're not sure when exactly he did it, but it's a good example of his stonework. So we have here his house and two pieces of his work um, in the landscape to this day. I think that's really wonderful. Our next residence is a little more modest. This is 50 Needham Street, and it's the Petri residence. Petra, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that. So Marianne Petra was the only widow who applied, as far as we know, to the housing program. She was born in Liverpool. She came here in 1910. Her husband had come two years earlier. In 1916, James enlisted in the Nanaimo B Company, 103rd Battalion. Uh, he was a private when he died in France, and Marianne was subsequently granted a military pension. So four years later, there's Marianne living in Nanaimo. She has four children and her mother lives with her. And they live in a little house, I believe it's on Nickel Street. 
She gets a $2,000 loan, which presumably was vetted to say that she could afford this, and the house was completed in 1921. By 1925, she marries David Kenny, who's a waiter in Vancouver, and in 31, they moved to, they both of them, and presumably their children too, moved to Vancouver. So that is 10 years. So I'm wondering if she waited that long to take advantage of the $300 rebate. I don't know. For poor Marianne, who lost her first husband in 1944, she loses her youngest son, Parkin, uh, in World War II. She dies, as you can see there, in 1964, and her second husband dies in 1978. So Mary, who came here across the ocean from England, husband dies in the war. She's left with four young children, uh, or youngish children at that point only to 20 years later lose that youngest son in the war. It's, um, it's probably a typical story, sad but true. And that medal that you see on the left of the screen, that is a silver memorial medal given by King George to the widows and mothers of uh, Canadian soldiers who died during the war. Now we have, um, you always have to throw in a rogue and I think I found our rogue. This is William Thomas Harvey Firth, born in Belfast. He enlisted in Victoria and his occupation was listed as a rancher in Alkali Lake, which is uh, maybe half an hour south of um, Williams Lake. He was in the 11th Canadian Mounted Rifles that later became the BC Dragoons. So they started in 1908 as the Mounted Rifles and they're still going today. I think they're headquartered in Vernon or someplace like that. Uh, it's it's now called the Dragoons and I put their um, insignia or their, I, I don't know the correct military word over there. Um, he is then um, a private in that. We think in England, he marries a woman named Elsa Ambler. In 1919, he's discharged. In 1920, we could find a daughter born in Vancouver. And in 1921, he completes his home with a better housing loan. At the time, he works at Whitty Brothers as a secretary treasurer, which sounds, um, uh, maybe we would just call a bookkeeper today, but I don't really know. Whitty Brothers was a local firm that was a wholesale um, cigar and confectioners. So he worked there as a secretary treasurer. He's got his wife and daughter, maybe um, another child that, I don't know how many children he ultimately had, but then things go south and this is what happens. By 1923, the paper states that he has left the city. That's the term they use. And in fact, in one of the council reports, they say the same thing, he's left the city. Uh, some kind of shenanigans went on with the Witty brothers and they got a judgment against him and then he had to, the sheriff had to sell some of his things to satisfy that judgment. That happens in around September. And in November, poor Mrs. Firth is selling everything, all of their um, belongings. And clearly there is at least one child because in that list on the right is a crib and a um, English baby carriage. But that looks like absolutely everything that they owned was sold for cash when he defaulted on this loan and left town. In 1929, Elsa Firth marries William Hobie in Vancouver and we don't see her again. We're not sure, we have no idea what um, happened to him. When Elsa remarries on the marriage certificate, she's listed as a widow. So sometime between 1923 and 29, uh, Mr. Firth must have died, but there's no death certificate for him in all of BC and we don't really know what happened to him but this poor woman um, wasn't a particularly big town and the humiliation and the um, flat out worried about how she was gonna support herself must have been quite tremendous so I feel for her even now. And then I thought it'd be really cool to show you uh, what buildings still remain. I'd say about half of them are still there in the landscape. You can drive by them or walk by them. Um, the ones that are the most, were the most demolished were the ones in the Newcastle town site neighborhood. Most of those have been over time replaced by either condos or apartments. 
the uh, the biggest group that still exists is uh, basically in what we now call the old city. So here we have 265 McCleary. Unfortunately, I had to get these photos from Google Earth and I can't always get a good view. But even on this one, you can see it, it looks modest and it's got the typical bungalow uh, gable brackets right there. This is 220 Kennedy Street. This house looks like it maybe over time hasn't had that much done to it. It's your sort of um, sort of prototypical California bungalow st style house. This is the home of M.A. Planta residence. This is the one he built. He received this lot for a dollar from his father, who was A.E. Planta, our uh, erstwhile senator um, in the 1917-18, somewhere in there. It's on Stewart Avenue. So it is one of the few survivors in that neighborhood. It's also one of the few that has a, a slightly different style. This is the Segi residence. This is another good example of a bungalow style. Um, when you go on Google Earth, but look at it from above, that entire back end has been added on at some point to make the house bigger. These houses seem to be generally about between 950 and 1000 square feet, as they were originally drawn. Here's the Summers residence. Again, the typical gable brackets, the front porch offset. So yeah, the typical features of that house. 107 Melton Street. Now I have been in this house and I was surprised that this was one of them because I never really, you know, you don't go to someone's house and start looking to see what, you know, what kind of construction it has. But now that I think of it, uh, the entire section on the, the left, they did say was added in the 50s, around the same time the front dormer was added. So who knows exactly what this looked like in the beginning, Mr. Black was one of our many um, people who defaulted on the mortgage. So he wasn't there for very long. These, both of these houses were, were um, occupied by people with the last name Young. I'm not sure what their um, familial connection is. Are they brothers, father and son? I don't really know. They're both still there. The one on the left has recently had quite a bit of a renovation to clean it up and put some new siding, things like that on it, new stairs. I mean, I can't imagine by coincidence that, you know, 150 is a, a young and 146 is another young and they're not related. But other than that, I'm not sure exactly what that connection is. The one on the left was lost to foreclosure also. So you see these little craftsman bungalows, you see um, people trying to make a decent home for them in the sort of popular style for sort of upper, lower middle class, upper working class. But did the scheme actually meet the moment? The moment in time when things were really very, very bad. These were people that came home from a war, sometimes were confronted with the effects of the Spanish flu. Um, came home to mass unemployment, mass strikes, very little housing, and inflated rental prices. The scheme had a lot of big ask for the scheme to do. So let's sort of look at, did it meet the moment? Um, about half of the Nanaimo applicants successfully discharged their mortgages. So they lived there for the 20 years, and then they discharged it, and they were done. The Better Housing Scheme does mark the beginning of government affordable housing initiatives. Ultimately, the um, leads to these types of programs uh, contributes to the founding of the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation. So it's the beginning of it. It's interesting just in that. It did galvanize community groups locally, and I'm sure that's true across Canada. Uh, both the local council of women, the board of trade, and the, well, and also the Great War Veterans Association advocated for more money for this program because there was such a need. So those are kind of the positive things. And here's some of them, maybe not so positive. There were about eight defaults. So in addition to, you know, unemployment and rental prices that you couldn't even make, make the payment on your house. And the average payment was $7 a month. Uh, of course, I don't know what that is. It's only important in relationship to what your income is. Uh, the city was fairly harsh about the defaults. If you defaulted, because I think they were worried about carrying all these mortgages, 
they put your name in the paper, which seemed harsh. And then they gave you two weeks to come up with that money and also to pay any back taxes at the same time, because at that time, the municipalities were responsible for uh, sending tax notices and collecting taxes. There was no BC assessment. So they had two weeks and a few of them were eight, seven, eight months behind. So that was maybe a lot of money to come up with. And those people appear to have lost that property. A few of them had to move and they got uh, approval to transfer their mortgage. There was a significant waiting list. So there was by far way more demand than the money supply would allow. And so the program was, it appears to have been really underfunded. Municipalities balked over the amount of administration and did make several, uh, our council, the Nanaimo council made several protestations to the federal government about the amount of work it was and that perhaps the federal government should take it over. And here's something to consider. I mean, there's probably all sorts of other pros and cons there that uh, I haven't really thought of, or perhaps you can think of them. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot to think about with the sort of programs that the government offered after the war, and this is only one of them. There's so many pros, so many cons. Uh, it would be almost a life's work to go through all the different programs. But something that we can consider on a more immediate level and uh, something we could do fairly rapidly is we may want to consider putting one or more of these houses on our community heritage register. We have very little from World War I. We have our cenotaph. Uh, we have um, the remains of some barracks and stables over in um, Sid Clark Park. I believe that's what it's called um, between um, Kennedy and McCleary. And that's kind of it for the First World War. Um, you could make an easy, good case for Mr. Millen's and the Cenotaph and the other statue and his home, uh, all beautifully intact. Or in fact, any one of these um, people that I've talked about today or others where more research could be done. So I think it's worthwhile to consider um, getting something on the Heritage Register. I want to thank you all for listening to this tonight. I know it's getting late and I know it was rather long, um, but I am very grateful that you were here to enjoy it. And I thank you so much. And if you have any questions, you can email me uh, or you can email the Historical Society. And that is Nanaimo Historical Society, Society at shaw.ca. Um, or you can go on our Facebook page and message us through there. If you have questions specifically about this data, this history, or, or you know, should, um, anything that you wanted me to follow up on with you, uh, please feel free to do that. And there you have it. And thank you again so much for watching. And also, um, I'm going to see you in the next little bit. Hi, it's me again. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to do a few uh, closing remarks. At first, I'd like to thank uh, Linda for her presentation. It was a delight to work with her. And also to remind everybody that this is the last talk of our fall lecture series. The Historical Society will be back in January with their traditional show and share event. And I encourage membership especially to submit a video for that. For those kind of details, you can check out our Facebook page. And um, if you like our YouTube channel, please consider liking this video or subscribing and hope to see you again in January. Have a lovely holiday season. Thank you once again. Bye now.